Roland Butcher, who's with us tonight. Butch, great to see you, and thank you very much for giving up your time in Barbados. Uh, to I know it'll be sort of nice, nice afternoon to be strolling along the beach, but you've agreed to sit indoors and chat to us for, for an hour. So thank you very much. Uh, you know, Butch, let's just start with the West Indies, where obviously you are. And uh, after that rather disastrous World T20, they've re-emerged um, in this series and deservedly winners 3-2 and sort of seem to um, re-engage with the T20 format and kind of move their game on as well. Yeah, I think really it was a welcome win and welcome good performances. Um, yes, as you know, the World Cup was a bit of a disaster, but it really was a disaster before they got to the Emirates. Um, the team selected really was a very old team um, playing an old fashioned type of game, which really didn't come to fore in the, in the World Cup. And, and obviously they exited at the first hurdle. I mean, since then, really, they've also had a very disappointing series against Ireland. Don't forget they lost to Ireland 2-1 um, um, in the Caribbean a couple of weeks ago. So the team must have been pretty dumb at that stage. But I think the games against England, um, there were five excellent matches. Um, at the end of the day, I think West Indies just would have edged it and really deserved to win that final game. But all in all, it was a very competitive series um, against two sides that I always felt from the off were fairly evenly matched. Um, I didn't feel that England, obviously, the team they bought was their strongest side. Mm -hmm. And we know the players had a missing from that side that would have made them a much more formidable um, team. But West Indies also had something to prove. And of late, uh, you know, when they play against England, certainly in the Caribbean, they always find a little bit extra um, to put into the series. So I expected a bit of a rebound um, in this series. I felt it would always go as it went 3-2. I couldn't say who the winner was going to be because I thought the team was so evenly matched. But all in all, I think it was five good games. I think spectators enjoyed it. Um, you know, they really enjoyed it. The English fans enjoyed themselves being here, obviously out of English winter, being able to watch cricket again. And really for us in the Caribbean, we really haven't had any spectators at cricket now for a couple of years. So this really was a welcome return to that. And we look forward now to the Test Series coming up in March. Yeah, and so do a lot of English fans, I'm sure, who also have been starved of, of being able to go to matches, certainly overseas. Uh, obviously not much in the way of Australian uh, fans in Australia. So um, actually, I mean, we're all very envious of, of, you know, your life in Barbados. I remember hearing Everton Weeks once saying that, you know, he lived in Barbados all his life, aged mid eighties, and he's never had a cold once. I don't think he's ever had a day's <laughs> illness. So uh, it, it is one of those unbelievably healthy places to live. And I was always envious actually um, playing with, with you and, um, you know, Norman Cowans, Neil Williams, Will Slap, people like that, um, rest their souls, God rest their souls. But, uh, it, you know, you always looked incredibly healthy. And I, I just, I don't know, I, I, I wish I'd been brought up in Barbados. It must be a wonderful place to have been brought up in, actually. I mean, Simon, we are, we are blessed, really. And, and I think sometimes we don't really realise just how blessed we are, because, one, it's a very small place. You know, you've got sunshine 365 days of the year. And, you know, you've got the sea is there all the time. So we're very, very fortunate that we can live a, a very outdoor life. And as you say, a, a fairly healthy life. So, you know, I, I certainly appreciate it. Um, I did when I was a kid. Obviously, I was aware for a long time, but now I'm back. You know, I'm trying to enjoy it as much as I can. Now that I'm retired as well from, from work. You, ne you never retire. I don't, I don't <laughs> believe I don't believe you're ever going to retire, actually. But so what's, what's your... Um, make us feel even more jealous what's your sort of daily routine um you know what, what do you do all day for most days well listen my, my my routine really revolves around um you know the things that i that i have to do i mean at the moment it really starts you know three days a week getting up at a quarter to five in the morning to take my grandson um to to, to the gym so he, he he has to go to the gym he's 19 the gym. A quarter to five Blimey. yeah they, they start at 5 30 so i i yeah, we're up at quarter to five i get him to the gym um so he he does his workout with the rest of the, the group 
Um, I use that opportunity to do some walking. Um, fortunately for us, the, you know, the gym is very close to um, the head coach at the BCA, Henderson Springer, who you probably know. And um, the walk that I go on from the gym takes me past Henderson Springer's house. So usually at six o'clock in the morning, he's out in his gallery reading the newspaper. So, you know, we stop and chat for half an hour and then I continue my walk and get back to the gym and then eventually takes my grandson home. So that's three days a week. The rest of the time, you know, I have, you know, I have friends to see, family, there's people always popping into Barbados. On top of that, obviously the projects that I'm working on and obviously I'm a director of the Barbados Cricket Association. So there are things to be done there. I'm chairman of the Center of Excellence um, the, and the Center of Excellence obviously is the main development pathway for Barbados cricket. So we have based at Lords um, on the 13 squad, 15, 17, 19, 23, the women, and obviously the senior national team. Uh, so, you know, I spend time, you know, going to their practices, if they've got matches, et cetera, et cetera. Quite a lot of paperwork. And obviously as a board director, you know, we have board meetings and all the things after that. You know, I'm also the, on the West Indies, they have a new committee called the, the Cricket, it's called the West Indies Outcome, Cricket Strategy and Outcomes Committee. Um, and that really is the one that, that runs the cricket and it has people on it like um, Darren Sammy, um, Sawan, Ian Bishop, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I spend, you know, time conversing with them. And um, as I said, the other projects that I'm working on here, both my football and, and cricket. So my days are full, Simon. And, mm. and I try to find some time to go to the beach as well. Of course you do. Wouldn't be a day without, a proper day without not going to the beach. And you're not very far away from it, wherever you are in Barbados anyway, really. Um, so it sounds to me as if, you know, there was a lot of criticism of the West Indies cricket, you know, a few years back. And one of the criticisms was that there weren't many ex-players involved on the administrative side. But the way you're talking, the Sammies and the Bishops and you and, you know, Desmond Haynes, the selector and stuff, it sounds as if they're bringing more ex-players or recent ex-players into the, the running of the game, which might obviously lead to a more successful team. Yeah, you're right. I think that's really started to happen um, of recent where more and more ex-players are getting... Um, involved with, with the administration of the game. I think in the past, most ex-players wanted to be involved with the coaching of teams. Um, and, you know, there are only so many jobs available for, for, for those positions. So not everybody can do that. Uh, but it's good to see that, you know, certainly administrative-wise now that more people are involved in that area. And do you, do you see a, a, a better situation between the players and the board now which has been a, a quite they've been at loggerheads for a few years is there a better relationship now do you think yeah the relationship now between the players and the board is much much better than for, you know after the ram Narain, you know the weeper when ram Narain was in charge of weeper as you know literally every week they're in court but um, since this new administration has taken on um, that is certainly one area that has been much, much better. I think once, once we have Heinz took over as the, the president of, of WIPA, you know, he has been much more in terms of working, wanting to work with CWI um, for the whole development of the game and the players than when Ram Narayan was in charge, which was, there was always a fight. So I don't think there has been one spat, certainly in the last four years between WIPA and um, CWA. So things are on that front, things are going pretty well. And does that um, suggest or could it promise uh, a better West Indies team, you know, looking ahead to the test series against England? I mean, actually, England's record in, in the Caribbean in test cricket isn't great anyway recently. But do you feel there is uh, there's some sort of hope, op optimism that the West Indies now can start to, to challenge and climb that World Series, World Test Championship table? because, you know, better players are emerging and there's a better sort of harmony going on anyway in the islands, uh, in, in, in the cricketing circles. 
that's a step in the right direction. But listen, West Indies have got a long, long way to go before they become a, a real first force in, in, in world cricket. There's no question about that. You know, there are lots of other things that we've got to put in place before you can see that sustainability going forward. West Indies, and you will see for the next few years, you will see good performances where, you know, they win matches, etc., and you're going to see some bad performances. And that, that's going to be what it's going to be like for a while because we still have many um, infrastructural problems um, to deal with um, in, in the region. Mm. All cannot be dealt with at the same time, but some has to be addressed and addressed very soon, uh, particularly with the individual territories. You know, the territories have got to produce a better player um, for West Indies to select. That means um, improving the level of our coaching, in improving the level of facilities, um, improving the quality of pitches, improving the quality of the first class game. And an area that we're pretty bad at in the moment is keeping players involved at a high level after under 19. You know, our current system does not allow for that to happen. We have in this region, the CWI run, they run an under 15 regional tournament, under 17 and under 19. When the under 19 tournament finishes, those players emerging out of the under 19, so are now expected if they want to be cricket, cricketers at the highest level, they're now got to compete with the franchise players who are under contracts in the team. And it's highly unlikely that um, many under 19s coming out of the, the whole region will make it into a franchise team. I mean, if you look at Barbados now, I mean, the under 19 World Cup is just about to finish. And I can mm. tell you that not one of those players will feature in the Barbados, Barbados setup. So that has been happening for years. And as a result of that, because there's no tournament after under 19, those players have had to go into club cricket, which are poorly resourced, bad facilities, no coaching, et cetera, et cetera. And those clubs are expected now to develop that player from where he is to be into the national team. For me, that is a major, major mistake. That's so, so over a 10 year period, West Indies have thrown away over a thousand regionally of their best on the 19 players because they cannot be fitted wow. into. And that, that's horrendous for a small place like the Caribbean with over just 6 million people. That's England amazing. can probably do that. You know, you've got 40 yeah. plus million, but in a space of 6 million, if you do that repeatedly, mm. um, you know, you're, you're going to struggle. So yeah. I have been fighting for the last few years at CWR level to get them to put in place an under-23 tournament. Because if you do that, it means that the, the territories who currently invest up to under-19 will be forced to keep those guys in the system up to under 23, whereby they're getting good facilities, full-time coaches, all the medical and, and scientific back, background to, to, to deal with. When I first, first put that to CWI, obviously CWI are in, are in a problem financially and obviously things were tight. Um, they recognized it, but couldn't do anything about it. But what they did say was that we would, as a starter, we would put in uh, on the 23 side as an emerging team into the regional 50 over competition. Right. They did that two years ago. And would you believe it that emerging team won the competition? Really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> which, which, which was quite ironic. Mm. Now, I am a, I've approached them again to try and get the, the tournament being part of the fixture, not just because the other. The under 23 is playing in the regional tournament. That's only exposes 15 players. Um, but, you know, we need to have those guys playing on, on a regular basis um, so that they can challenge the guys. Because mm. if you've got our, our franchise system is such that each territory has 15 contracted players um, to the franchise plus the test players, right? So in a place like Barbados, you know, that would probably give us maybe 22 players. On top of that, uh, we give um, 12 development contracts to, to younger players or the second team players. So on the 19, 
he, he has to come up against 27, 30 odd, 30 odd contracted players to get into the site from a club level. Um, so that's where we're at. So the question you asked, uh, we have a long way to go. Um, yeah. There are signs emerging, but until we can get those things right, a pathway, yeah. really, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I mean, that, really yeah. I, I mean, you know, th that said, you know, you're already st well, still producing good cricketers. I'm very impressed with Akil Hussain. I mean, he's a better spinner than anyone we've got in England. Uh, bowled very well in that one-day series. Bowled well against Bangladesh last year, I remember. And uh, some talent is still emerging, almost in spite of the system. Who who else would you pick out to look out for? That guy, that Myers. Is it Kevin Myers? I mean, he had an amazing. Test match yeah, debut, yeah, Kyle, obviously. I mean, Kyle Mears. Kyle Mears, um, sorry. Kyle Mears basically was one of our young players. Again, came through the system. Obviously played on the 19, etc. But, you know, couldn't get into the Barbados team. Obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, got the opportunity um, a couple of years later um, to go and play for the Wimwood Islands as, as a franchise player. Um, played two or three years for the, for the Winwoods, which was good for his cricket. Then eventually, um, you know, we drafted him back to Barbados a couple of years ago. And as I say, the rest, the rest is history. He's, you know, that same season he came back, scored probably the most runs for Barbados, second most runs in the region, and got his opportunity for West Indies, started off with a double, and, you know, he's, he's amongst the cricketers. So, you know, he is one of the cricketers obviously that has come through the system uh, and we need more of that. Mm. You know, we need, we need areas for these players to go because as I said, we've got 30 plus contracted players at Barbados. <clears throat> we've just had it on the 19 series, she was just finished. Uh, those boys coming out of those on the 19, where do you put them? Mm. Fortunately for us, we have under 23. We're the only one in the region right. But you've, got no, under under you've got no one to play. You've got no one to play. So, but so, yeah. you've got under twenty three. But all those guys are doing right now is is training because yeah. Yeah. you know there's no tournament for them to play. So what we did a couple of years ago was to um, Dominica um, put out a side and we took the under twenty threes there. So those are sort of things we have to do. I mean, but, it's, it's good. It's good that you're doing that, obviously. And it, I, I, I'm thinking back to to you know when you first came to England. And really, in the 70s and 80s, it was county cricket that was the sort of finishing school for many of the West Indies players. They were already very good, but they came to England and, and kind of, you know, honed their methods and, and then dominated the world. Just, just tell us, I mean, I know it's a long time ago now, but, you know, you came to England in the 60s uh, when you were, what, 12, 14? 13, 13. 13. Uh, just, tell, just tell us what it was like. Then, when you arrived, ah, it's a long time ago, but I can still remember. Um, so I mean, it was May, nineteen sixty-seven. Um, obviously, completely different to what I've been accustomed to. As I said before, you know, I, I lived in the country, um, East Point St. Philip, which is a, a rural parish in Barbados on the eastern tip. Um, lots of space, and as I said, sunshine, three hundred sixty-five days of the year. So. Coming to England in May, uh, even in May, it seemed pretty cool to me. And um, it took me quite a while to actually want to be out and about. But, you know, kids are fairly resilient. So eventually you make friends and you get out and you play, and etc. But it took a while, obviously, adjusting to a new lifestyle, um, new friends. I mean, I didn't know anyone because obviously you know, you've left all your school friends behind. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, it's just one of those things that you go through when you when you move continents. And really, that's what happened with me. My parents were already in England. Uh, when I arrived, I had two brothers and two sisters who were born in England. Uh, so it was just really fitting into a new family and really trying to find your way in, in the game again. And um, as you and know, were people, you know, what was the atmosphere like? Were people generally welcoming? Did you have uncomfortable experiences uh, that, that you're now thinking I could have uh, raised issues about? Or actually, was it all pretty comfortable and okay? Well, I was very lucky because my family lived in Stevenage, which was a, a garden city in a very 
it was a new town. Um, and I think, you know, my father was the first black person um, living in Stevenage, you know. So when I moved to Stevenage, it was um, certainly not like the city, not built up, etc. very quiet. Um, so you still had those old values of, you know, neighbors looking after each other. So I fell into a situation that in the end really worked well for me. And, and then I found the same sort of atmosphere once I got involved with Stevens Creek Club, the same caring relationships. And um, so my upbringing in Stevenage was one of being removed really from the, from the mainstream. So I, I was really lucky. So I suppose it, it sounds, you know, I mean, obviously there's been a lot in the last 10 years or so culminating in the Black Lives Matter movement, both in America and in the Caribbean and in England and elsewhere. And, and then all this stuff about the, the Asian um, issues as well uh, through Azim Rafiq. Um, and in, in, you know, accusing the game of being very institutionally racist sounds as if your experience was actually pretty harmonious. Maybe you were lucky. Well, I was, uh, I was lucky. Um, I think at every turn that I took, there was always someone there, um, you know, willing to assist me. As I said, it started, first of all, at Stevenage Cricket Club, where um, I had some guys at Stevenage who were much older than me, but really looked after me like a son. And it was really out of that that I was able to move on because at the time, um, the captain of the club was a, a guy by the name of Cyril Hammond. And um, Cyril was not only the captain, he was the manager of a local um, football club as well. And he got a job. He went to Gloucestershire County Cricket Club um, um, to work for them. And while there, he, he recommended me to the county as, as a young player to look at. Now, Gloucestershire then invited me down to Bristol. Um, I would go down, spend the summers with Cyril and his family who looked after me royally. They did everything, cleaning, cooking, dropping me here, there and everywhere, um, you know, for a couple of years. Um, then in 19, end of 1969, um, they thought I was obviously a bit young to come onto the full-time staff, sent me up to Lords um, for a trial with the MCC Young Professional. And again, I was lucky to run into Harry Sharp and Len Mansa, who again um, treated me like a son. And I had <clears throat> two very good years, 17 and 71 at the MCC, um, with them, you know, looking after me and pointing me in the right direction. And 72, as you know, I just moved across from one side of the ground to the other side with Middlesex. So, mm. you know, my, my way through always has been a, a, a easy and protected way, really. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I, of course, we then had, um, you know, 15 years of Middlesex or more, 16 years of Middlesex. I put my Middlesex jumper up in uh, <laughs> honour of you on my wall there. Um, still kind of just about holding together. The moths haven't got to it, luckily. Um, but, of course, you, you know, you're most famous, I suppose, for being the first black man to play for England. And I, I mean, I know at the time it didn't dawn on you that, how important that was, but... Uh, it, you were a bit of a trailblazer, actually, for a lot of other um, black players, either born in the UK or born in the Caribbean, to play for England. It, it you know, I, I, that must make you proud, actually. And just, just, um, uh, just talk a little bit about the players who came after you, who've often sort of get, shown you some gratitude for what you did. Yeah, looking back now, obviously, I'm very, very proud of that moment um, because. You know, it certainly was a breakthrough moment, not just for me, but it was a breakthrough moment for a lot of um, black players in England who suddenly felt empowered that, you know, if they did well, they'd get the opportunity. Um, obviously, at the time when I was selected and played, you know, that was the furthest thing from my mind because at that stage, you know, it was just a fulfillment of, you know, an ambition you had as a kid to play international cricket. So, you know, all you wanted to do was to play and do well. You, you didn't really understand the, the significance. But, you know, when you speak to people like Norman and Devon Malcolm and people like that who openly said that, you know, they said, well, look, Roland is no different to me. So, you know, I, I can certainly have a chance 
if I do well. So it certainly opened the doors for them to, to think positively about um, playing international cricket. And since then, you know, you've seen all the players that has, has followed that. I think there's some 21, 22 players, um, including females as well. So, yeah, it was a seminal moment, but something now that I look back on with pride. But as I said at the time, um, you know, I, I just felt like another player. And I mean, where do you think it went wrong for, for or where is it? Why is that, uh, you know, stream of, of black players in England dried up? What I think happened over time now, Simon, is that the, the emphasis in terms of recruitment in English cricket has changed. Um, as you would know, because you were very much part of the Middlesex side when I was there, you, you know the job that Don Bennett did as, as coach. Um, Don Bennett was not the traditional coach that we see now who is um, the head of the organization. Don Bennett really spent most of his time with the second 11 and the youth. And as you know, you know he was out really scouting um, for talent. So he was able to pick up the likes of Will Slack in you know, the backwaters of, of Buckinghamshire and Neil Williams and, and Norman and, and others for weeks, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So in them days, the coach's job was totally different to what it is now. You know that the first team was run by Bruce as captain. Um, Don Might Bennett really, yeah. really yeah, it didn't have a great deal to with, do with it. So the coach's job at that time was to identify talent and bring it into the youth setup, into the second 11, and eventually hand them over um, to mm. Mike Brady. I think what has happened now is that uh, I think the public school system has come uh, very much more to the fore. It was always obviously there, but it's come much more to the fore. You've got um, the public schools now have ex county players and, and test players as their cricket coaches. Um, so basically, you know, those players yep. are going to want to try and develop first class players because they're not going to just want to be in the job for the sake of being in the job. You know, they want to push their school and get as many players as possible. So then you find that the, the coaches in the county setups, because some of them would have played um, with these guys, suddenly have this affiliation and they're now able to communicate much better. So if I um, am friends with the coach at Radley, um, he was an ex-player, you know, I can pick up the phone and, and Simon, um, you got any good players? Mm. And Simon was, I think so and so and so and so. You'll trust Simon's judgment because Simon was an ex-player, he knows the standard, he knows what's required. So I think that has happened over time um, amongst the public schools. I'm not mm. saying that that is a bad thing, but as it, it has made it easier uh, for the coach to recruit players. He no longer has to tread around the backwaters mm. try, trying to find players. And, and as I you suppose know, also they have to, you know, there's more of a kind of pathway, which is an accepted route, where what you're saying is Don Bennett almost uh, almost usurped that route and just actually went and looked around and saw talent and basically sort of pulled it in, which was which was a nice uh, nice way of doing it. So well, that's right, um, because, because yeah. I mean, what, what, what really happened then is, and still happens now is you must remember that a lot of these black kids and Asian kids uh, were not playing in, in mainstream teams. So yeah. it, it, it was much harder to find them. You know, you, you had, so that's where you, you would find a guy playing for a team that you, like, you've never heard of. So that was, that's what happened then. Now, the situation like in, the inner part of London where facilities are not great for cricket and these guys cannot get a chance to play for your team, they will never get seen um, because, you know, if coaches are going to go to clubs, they're primarily going to look at mainstream clubs. Um, you know, on top of ordinary clubs, I mean, whether it's, whether it's your club or Shepherd's Bush or whatever, they will look mm. at the mainstream clubs. Mm. Um, mm. You know, they're not going to play, look at some yeah. group of guys playing at one step common mm. on a Sunday afternoon. So, you know, that's how the life has changed. Um, and really, you know, if you, if you want to find the talent, I always maintain that. And Harry Sharp always had to say, you know, which he said to me, well, you know, 
if you want a fighter, if you want a hungry fighter, you know, you've got to look in those areas for those people. And he's telling me there's no fighter like a hungry fighter. And I still believe uh, that. And um, Harry was, as you know what Harry was like, um, mm. you know, a great man, but a very wise guy as well. Mm. He didn't say much when he had something to say, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he, he made you laugh, yeah, but, he, but I he, remember that to this day because yeah. it's true. It's true. Yeah. It is true. Harry Sharp, he was a, for those who don't know, he was a, a, an arch blocker for Middlesex in the 50s. We used to take the piss out of him because he never hit <laughs> off the square. And I, I the, the thing I loved about him actually was that the fact that he was the scorer for, for our era. He So he went off, he'd come in in the dressing room in the morning and he always lit up a cigarette just before going off to the scorer's box and smoked half of it in the dressing room, of course, in those days. And then with his fingers, he stubbed out his cigarette, <laughs> half smoked, and then kept it in his mouth for the rest of the day. Then was well, scoring all day, you know, in the old fashioned way, come back in the dressing room at the end of the day for his whiskey and Coke or whatever, and light up the remainder of the fag <laughs> and then smoke yeah. the rest of it. I mean, well, God knows. Right. Yeah, amazing. That, that, that was an art for Harry, but um, as you know, mm. he's also a very funny man, and in his time, he was a good cricketer, obviously. Yes, he did yeah. well for Middlesex, and I, I, I would never forget a very funny story Harry told me that. He said one year he turned up there for Middlesex at Lancashire, and he pulled, in, pulled into the car park, and he's at the back of the car taking the gear out of the, the car, and a guy comes up to him. The previous year, Harry scored 100 at, at um, Old Trafford, and you know, Harry was a very slow player, so it would have been a long, torturous inning. So he's taking the gear out of the, the car, and this guy comes up to him. He doesn't know who he is. He said, uh, excuse me, sir, um, can you tell me, is that guy sharp playing today? And Harry said, yeah, he is. The guy said, well, I'm battling off home because he bored me <laughs> tears last night. <laughs> Yeah, oh. he did used to tell that story against himself, didn't he? He's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a funny guy, classic character. Um, just just one more question for me. Um, so, you know, leading on from the, obviously, the, the change in culture of, of cricket and the things that have happened recently, perhaps because of that, you are embarking on a tour this summer of the UK uh, uh, on a, a diversity and inclusivity mission. So, so tell us a bit about that and where you're going to go and what you're hoping to achieve and why you're doing it as well. Well, listen, um, Simon, as you know of late, we all know what has been done and what has been said. And really, there is need for um, clarity and there's need for assistance. Yes, I'm undertaking this diversity and inclusivity tour of the UK during the summer um, for a few months. And really, you know, I'm aiming to, you know, give talks schools, colleges, counties, minor counties, clubs, etc., etc., along with, um, you know, other appearances, you know, um, some coaching, etc., etc. So it is, it is that type of tour, but the whole idea of diversity, um, someone like myself who I believe played in an era when uh, I don't think the rest of the cricketing world in England understood what diversity was about. And we played in a team that was extremely diverse um, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, there's a story there to be told. So um, certainly from my perspective. So that is what I'm intending to do, to really show people that diversity can be good for your organization because we're the, you know, we're also looking to do it with companies as well, that, you know, the whole concept of diversity doesn't mean that it's going to degrade your, your company or make it any weaker. In actual fact, um, done properly, it will enhance the performance of your team, uh, the performances of your company, etc. So it's very much that sort of tour. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, the second half of the tour, um, Desmond Haynes will be with me. Um, he would have been there for the entire tour, but obviously he's, no he's got a new job now as um, lead selector of the West Indies. So, um, so he will join me the second half um, of the tour. And, um, you know, we look to, to go around the country and I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, I think it will. I mean, tell us in a minute how, how you connect with that. Um, I mean, I suppose 
you know, my experience of uh, playing with you and, you know, Norman and, and Wayne Daniel and Neil Williams, Will Slack, et cetera, Paul Weeks, I found it really inspiring, actually. Um, I found it, uh, you know, very stimulating to play with you because I felt you were very dedicated to the skills of the game, but not in a, a, a sort of um, relentless way, but in a, in a very skill-based way. I mean, when you practiced your fielding, you do enough. You know, you wouldn't do tons and tons of endless catching. You just do a few swoops. We used to call you Hoover, didn't we? Because you ran in at full pelt, hoovered it up and hurled it over the, over the stumps. I, I, you retained an element of fun, I think, in your practice. And, and also, you know, things like stretching and rather than endless sort of bodybuilding, which one or two players did too much of. But in the main, there was an emphasis on, on stretching and limbering up and not expending too much energy until the, the moment when you actually had to perform. I found that very um, helpful. And, you know, because I would be, I'd be in the nets endlessly, but I found the way that, that you know, you and 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 you know Norman and you know Neil and people like that Nelly practiced was was very relaxed and made practice enjoyable. Yeah, well, for me, listen, practice is something that I enjoyed, and, and I realized that it's something that you have to do. So, you know, it's something you had to like. Um, I would say it was very much down to my upbringing, where um, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, um, you know, I worked very very hard on my feeling. Um, and the reason for that was that as a kid, my hero in cricket was Colin Bland. And, you know, people tend to forget also he was a very fine batsman. But my, main, my first attraction to him as a youngster growing up in Barbados was because of his field and exploits. Um, so I would try to model myself on him, having never seen him, just when he read about him. But just imagining the type of things that he, that he did uh, to become good. So, and I also believe that you know, in order to play the sport or any sport that you need to be an athlete. So uh, not a muscle bound athlete, you need to be fairly flexible, um, et cetera, and, and do enough to, to leave something for the game um, because you can often do too much. And then when the, the big moments come in the game, the, you've got nothing left. So that was always my approach um, to training. I, I, I enjoy training, and, um, but, you know, I, I did it so that I can perform on, on the field. And actually, there was a competitiveness to the way you trade. I remember actually bowling to Desi in the nets. And, you know, whereas, you know, most players would be just sort of, you know, give me a few half volleys or, you know, make me get me in the shape of, of the game. He wanted a competition in the nets and he wanted to take the bowlers on. And again, that made that made practice fun. So uh, to, just to sum up, you know, this tour that you're doing, um, what's the message? And, you know, what are you hoping will be conveyed to the people who are there? Well, the, the message for me is, as I said, diversity and inclusivity works. There's no question about that. It, it, it is not something to be afraid of. It is something to be embraced, and it works. That, that very much is the message. I am hoping that um, the persons who, you know, who attend these things, when, when they leave, they also leave with that same idea that, yeah, this can work. Uh, you know, if we do this a certain way, it will benefit our organization, it will make it stronger, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the things that I want to really leave um, um, when it's all over in England, that people going forward, you know, they've got a much clearer idea, idea uh, of what diversity is all about, how it can work, the benefits of it, and, um, and then for them really to put, it, to put it into practice. Have you got a story relating to that i mean is, is, is you know, i know you said you know playing for middlesex and obviously it was a very diverse team is there one sort of story or incident that you use to to underline exemplify it well i mean th there isn't one story because my my presentation is really as i said with the background of diversity and then going into that and then bringing in some of my um personal experiences i mean I, I will use, the, and I will also use the Middlesex team as, um, mm. in terms of diversity, if you look at all the players that we had in the seven at the time, and the different backgrounds, et cetera, that they came from, you know, from Mike Brady down, you know, you had people, you know, John Embry, you know, Peckham in, 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 in South London, um, you had Gat, 
You know, then you had the right honorable Tim Lamb, you know, from a different level. You, you know, Mike Grilly, Kieran. Gunner Gould from Slough, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, Phil Edmonds, yeah. you know, Zambia yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and Cambridge. So, yes. you know, those sort of experiences that, of that diverse, diverse team that we had that was able to come together as a group mm. and be extremely successful. So diversity was working for Middlesex as far back as the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Mm. So, you know, that, that, that is the proof for me that, you know, it is something that works and works well. And how do people connect with your, your tour? Well, right now um, you can contact um, Sean Belugi, and Belugi is B E W L U I G I, and um, Sean's number is 07898842781, or you can um, email him at Sean, S H A W N, at intune, I N T U N E, com dot co dot uk. So that's Sean at intune com dot co dot uk. Okay, we'll 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 post those we'll post those um those addresses out so that uh, that people can connect. Great. Okay. Well, that's really good. Good luck with that. And I, I'm looking forward to going. Actually, I really want to uh, to well, take part or enjoy it uh, at some point. So uh, look forward to your itinerary at some point uh, in the next couple of months. Right. Let's um let's get Simon, everybody involved here. here. Um, I will. It's Will. Hello. Sorry, I've been drafted in as as a as a, a producer because um, okay. North, North All right. Great. Here. So, right, brilliant. Um, so there we go. So I'm going to bring in uh, Annie first. I so, think I'll tell you what. Before you do, we I think we pro promised Robin uh, first question, yes. or was it? No, it was Richard actually. Is yes. it? Is Richard Shelley yes, it here? Was Richard, yes. Which yes, Richard missed Richard. out on uh, the questioning last yes. uh, the other day. Yes. He did. So um, if he's available, are Richard, you there, Richard? I will. I will tell him. See to if you can um, set him up, unless he's go. gone off in a huff. Preoccupied. If not, Richard, if you're there. If not, um, there we go. Yes. Yeah, is he there? Here we go. Let's try and let's try that now. He might have good to evening. click his own. There we go. You there, Richard? Here's Richard. Yeah. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Hi, How evening. Doing? Sorry, good timing. Just making a cup of tea. Sorry, I disappeared. <laughs> um, yeah. So I wanted to touch on the tour of Mike Gatting to South Africa in 89 running, which I think you originally signed up for and then changed your mind. I just wonder what the thinking was behind the original signing up and then changing your mind. And do you think those tours actually had any benefit in South Africa to what we now see as multicultural cricket? Yeah, you're, you're stretching my mind back to 1989 now. And um, it's a long time ago, but yes, um, originally I had signed up to go on the tour. As I said, 1989, I was coming very close to the end of my career. Um, I was asked to, to go on this tour to South Africa. Um, I was told that, you know, it would make a difference to how things were operating in South Africa. I had been offered the opportunity to go before. Um, Simon will remember when Vincent van der Boyle played with us. Um, you know, Vincent had tried to get me to go uh, to play for the Wondrous Great Club. And, at the time, I wasn't too sure because um, Wonders had never ever had a black player before that. So um, I, I wasn't too sure at the time, but obviously South Africa was a place that, you know, would play cricket. I, I remember um, I, I got myself in a bit of bother um, before that during the 1981 Tour de Caribbean when we had issues with Robin Jackman and the cancellation of the tour, et cetera. But, um, at the time, there was a colleague of Simon's who was writing a book um, on the tour, and he had to interview every player. There was a chapter for every player. And following the cancellation of the tour in Guyana, um, the tour management, A.C. Smith and others, told all of us not to have any mention at all about South Africa because the rest of the tour could be in jeopardy. Now, uh, in doing my um, chapter with the, with the man, we did everything we had to do, and then at the end of it, off the record, he says to me, well, would you, if England went to South Africa in the future, he's talking about the full England side, would you go? 
And my response was, well, you know, if I'm selected in an England site um, to go to South Africa and England to go in, I will go. Now, that's quite an innocent response. But yeah. the, the headlines um, in the newspaper, in my first test match, actually, the second day, I came in and the, and the manager said to me, AC Smith, can I see you back at the hotel um, when we get back? I said, sure. So I'm thinking all day, I'm thinking, well, what have I done during the day that he wants to see me? So I go into his room and he throws his newspapers at me. And the headline is, Butcher says he's going to South Africa, right? <laughs> oh, totally out of context. So even, you know, and I was prepared to go out for the England team as well. Now, moving on now to 1989. Um, obviously, this is some eight years later. Um, the tour was talked about. Um, as I said, it was sold to us as um, being helpful to the cause in South Africa. And I had agreed to go uh, on that basis. Um, but yeah. I, the, the ANC came over to England to see me. Um, I had the clergy all over England talking to me. And obviously, Middlesex was totally against anybody going. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And long story short, you know, eventually I I really had to then withdraw myself um, from the tour because I then believed that um, at that time it probably was not the best time or the best thing for me, even though it was at the end of my career. And do you think it? Thank do you. you think those tours? I think Richard's other question was: Do you think those tours actually did have any impact on the eventual dismantlement of apartheid? Well, I mean, it's, it is hard to say. I mean, when you speak mm. to some people, some people say, yes. I mean, you, I mean I'm sure Gat and others think that it had a part to play. Um, you know, the, the last tour, obviously they went on, they were not there for very long because Nelson Mandela was then released from prison and there was no need really for the tour to continue. So mm. um, they would say that their presence, you know, w w was part of the process. Um, who's to say that it wasn't? Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Uh, Annie, you you, yes. you 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 uh you did request um the long awaited return, Mike. Darling. Long awaited return of Annie. Uh, yeah, I, I believe you know back. each other, don't you? Anyway. Yeah. Yes. I've only come back to see Roland. Annie, <laughs> hey, how are you? Always <laughs> lovely to see. Lovely to see you and hear you. You know that. Lovely to see you. And I'm uh, one of my first questions because uh, I didn't know about your tour so much. Is are you going to come to Somerset? Well, I mean, it depends who in Somerset wants us. I mean, I, uh, I, I, okay. I, will send you the, I will send you the information. Okay. And obviously, information will go to the Somerset County Cricket Club as well, as mm -hmm. well as the, some clubs in Somerset. So, okay, uh, I'll see what I can do. Try and. Uh... Who wants us? We'll get us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, how lovely to be back, Simon, as well. Yeah, it's nice to see you. Yeah, I see you've got uh, one of the um, new shirts, Simon. Are you. Um, the cinch ones, yeah. Yeah. Are you yeah. going to be playing at all? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, actually, I um, I I think uh, I don't think the cinch company is that that proud of their sponsorship at the moment. So maybe we should cover it over. Um, anyway, <laughs> go on, so carry on. Annie, on Annie, 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 will you be coming to the to the test series this year? I can't. Um, not no. Get Barry to invite me over, and I will. <laughs> it was. Three years ago, um, about now, wasn't it, when we were over, yeah. With, yeah, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. And, um, with Jason Holder getting his double century. Yeah, we had mm. a good time. Oh, no. Anyway, um, well, kind of, um, Richard sort of asked my question, really, but... Um, well, think of another one, then. Yeah, well, it was, I was going to ask if, um, partly going on from that, um, whether... Uh, there's been any response reaction to Ashley Gray's book, The Unforgiven, um, The Unforgiven, after um, after he's written that in the West Indies. Uh, have people, you know, have some of the players who were disgraced as such come out of um, hiding a little bit? To be quite honest, Annie, nothing has changed. I think it, it, it has <laughs> just continued. Um, the Caribbean really is a very unforgiving place, and. Um, <laughs> You know, those guys were not forgiven then. I don't mm. think they'd be forgiven now. I, th I think it was wrong mm. because, you know, the rest of the world at the time banned their players for a period of time. Uh, West Indies went and banned their players for life. 
and you know you can you can you can actually trace back the demise of West Indies cricket yep. to that period because in effect what West Indies did um, thinking that what they were doing was the noble thing to do and the right thing to do they actually remove the sec the second tier of their international team because mm -hmm. the likes of Sylvester Clark etc cetera, etc cetera, who would come into the side if there are injuries or loss of form, they remove that entire tier. So which meant that when the older boys like Viv and others got a little bit too old, you were now going to third tier players. Mm. And we've never recovered from that. So in many ways, we have been architects of our own downfall, uh, believing that we were doing the moral thing in banning these players for life. But the question you ask, really, it is not talked about. Um, there are no moves to do anything to reintegrate the guys. It is just not discussed at all. Is there anybody from that tour who was allowed back? Because some of them I know, you know, were, well, were exiled there, from their islands, but were some some were able to come back to Barbados, weren't they? I mean, Franklin uh, Stevenson, yeah, for example. Yes, but the, the, the only one that the only one that ever played really was um, Ezra Mosley. Um, right. After that, no one else. Um, no one. Frank, no Franklin one Stevenson. Played. Nope. Franklin is still here um, running his own academy, has not been involved with mainstream cricket um, since his retirement. Um, hmm. Yeah, it, it's, and Barbados is, is perhaps a, a much more lenient place than some of the other places, but hmm. uh, you, you've known what is happening in Jamaica to the likes of Chang and Austin and, and those guys. So, Lawrence Rowe, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, hmm. so it's, it, I think Ashley Gray has written a really good book. You know, I, I've yeah. asked many times when he came here. Um, you know, some of yeah, them. He said you were helpful. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's a nice guy, and um, yeah, you know, he, he's really, you know, opened up uh, what it is like. Some of the guys didn't take part in the book because they, they, they like wanted to forget about it. Uh, yeah, Colin like, Croft didn't want to, did he? <laughs> and Emerson Trotman and others like that. But yeah. mm -hmm. you know, I, I. I I believe really it is time for um, those guys to be pardoned and uh, let me move mm. on. Actually, that's really interesting. In fact, somebody's approached me about making a film about that book or about the story. And it actually really your, should be. Yeah, and, and well, your take on it, Butch, that you know it it actually was the sort of beginning of the, the West Indies demise is a very interesting angle. Yeah, but it was. It was. You know, mm. we we we. we we had we had to go to, to the third tier players, and mm -hmm. you know the third tier players trying to make it at international level is not going to happen. Mm. Good question. Good good subject. Right. Anyway, thank you, Annie, and um, welcome back and all that. Um, right. right. We're go so who's next, Will? Going to go to Sam. A new, Sam new, is our uh, new member, Sam O'Brien. So welcome to our club, Sam. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, kicking myself for not joining earlier, but uh, fantastic to be on. Thanks. Um, my question is related to the colonies down south where I'm from, um, further south than, than where you are now, uh, about your time in Tasmania. And if it's going back too far, I've got another question um, <laughs> up my sleeve. But my research says that you spent a little bit of time in Tasmania. Um, my question is, what was that like? And then compared to your time at Middlesex, obviously had a lot more time at Middlesex, but in terms of the system, the structure, how did you find it? Obviously Tasmania is gorgeous. And also um, probably most importantly, everyone wants to know, did you ever have a beer with Bernie? <laughs> Listen, Tom, let me tell you something. Tasmania is one of the greatest experiences that I've ever had. Um, the people are absolutely fantastic. I am friends with the people there to this very day. An actual two, two mornings ago at four o'clock in the morning, I received a call from Stan Reed and his wife, Debbie, who played in the same team as me. Uh, they obviously didn't realize what the time was, but we had a long <laughs> conversation. I made some fantastic friends um, in, in Tasmania. Um, and obviously, Booney was in the same team. He, he was a slim um, Boone at that time. Um, <laughs> he, he only really enjoyed himself much later, but you could see the promise there. But, Overall, the time that I spent in Tasmania, those six months, it was absolutely fantastic. It was the first year that Tasmania were allowed to play all 10 
um, games in the Sheffield Shield. Before that, they used to play only five, um, mm. and five home games. That year, for the first year, they were allowed to play um, 10, which was five home, five away. So obviously we played in Melbourne, we played in Sydney, we played in Perth, Adelaide, and Brisbane. And it's also because it was their first year, they were allowed to have two overseas players um, instead of the normal one. So the two overseas players were Michael Holden and myself uh, with the two overseas players. And yeah, it was a fantastic time. I've been back to Tasmania a couple of times since then. Um, you know, and I'm very much in contact with friends that I made at that point in time. For me, you know, it's a great place, you know, and, and my kids loved it. You know, my daughter spent the first six months of her life in, in Tasmania. Um, so it, it is a, a very, very dear place to my heart. And while I was there, Jamie Cox was a little kid that I used to have around. Um, he, he, he was um, the son of, a, of my very good friends that we made. So we used to spend a lot of time down at the, at the beach house. Um, you know, he'd be playing cricket, et cetera, et cetera. And J.B. Cox has gone on to be, you know, top player. And now, obviously, he's in a very important position at the MCC. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for your quote about um, there's nothing like a hungry fighter too. Well, uh, I'm going to take that on board and feed that back to my students and myself. So I appreciate it. What, what, what do you do, Sam? I lecture paramedics at Staffordshire Uni. So I'll try and I'll be getting in touch to see if you can fit us into your itinerary as well. For your tour yeah that sounds interesting right great well keep keep tabs on uh, on butch and his and his tour that sounds really interesting good well thanks thanks for your one where are you from you from tassie as well no i, I am from uh, just outside melbourne a place called ballarat it's where oh, the gold yeah. was found in australia but uh, yeah. yeah just stick yeah. with melbourne yeah. yeah 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 okay cool well thanks and yeah. uh, i hope you uh, you have a long and um, prosperous uh, uh connection with our club anyway cheers um so, uh, Will. Right, I'm going to Rob now. Here he Evening, is. Evening, gents. How are you doing? Hi, Rob. Hi, Rob. Evening, Ronan. Thanks for doing this. Uh, pleasure to just fascinating listening to you. Um, I've got two quick questions, really. One is, um, who would you have loved, who did you like to play with the most in the Middlesex side? So, you know, if you were out to, to you know, if you were walking out, who would you like to be walking out with to bat? And uh, secondly, have you got any juice, juice, juicy stories on Yoza? <laughs> um, I will ask them both of those. Um, I'll tell you what, I, I used to enjoy batting with Gat because, you know, Gat was a similar player to myself. So he, he, he could take the pressure off you quite easily by dominating the bowling. So the fact that you had somebody like him who could do that, um, you know, it was good for you. If, if I was if I was batting with Yoza, but I can't just say that because uh, I, Yoza will come up, come back and tell you what happened when we played Gloucestershire at Cheltenham, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, yeah, Mike Gatton, I think was someone I love batting with because he he took away he could take away the pressure and um, allow you to be to be yourself. Now in terms of Yoza, um, two things in, in relation to Yoza. One, I will give him credit for that um, against Gloucestershire, we put on 98 for the last wicket, of which he had just scored two. And, you know, he would keep telling me that I was the one that got out as well. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he actually came not out in that partnership and I got out. Now, the other thing about Yaza, I found that Yaza was a very... You know, he was a very easygoing guy. You know, he, he was not intense. You know, I think underneath he probably was intense, but outside, he, you know, he appeared to be very calm and collected. But he did get the wrath of John Embry one day when, in those days, Simon used to write for one of the newspapers, and um, John Embry had lost his driving license, and um, he couldn't drive. So Embers got himself a, a, sp a sponsored bicycle. He didn't live far from Lords, so he was able to ride the Lords on a bicycle. And um, I came in one morning and Embers was absolutely fuming and I couldn't understand what was going on. And I inquired, they then showed me this newspaper. What Yaza had done was, Yaza did a cartoon outside the Lords gate of um, a bike with a, a lady's basket on the front. 
and there was a, a phone in the basket and the answering phone was coming out saying, uh, John Embry is not available at the moment. Please leave a message and we'll get back to you. No, <laughs> <laughs> Embers was not at all pleased with that. Uh, we all saw the funny side of it, but um, those are the two things we, about, about Simon that I can tell you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people don't realize, you know, Simon was, he was, he was a fine bowler. I mean, he had a very easy, lazy run up, quick arm action, generated good pace. And, but he always did something with the ball. I mean, most of the time, because I, I feel that that slipped most of the time when Yoza was playing. And um, his action, I always felt that he was going to swing the ball in. But the amount of times that he got the ball to leave the back, I, I, I wondered, and he'll have to tell you, whether he actually knew what he was doing or if it just happened. <laughs> but, like, um, like, you know, he, he did draw some great deliveries. No, I, I didn't know what I was doing at all, actually. <laughs> no, it was, it was a total accident. <laughs> And I mean, the, the thing is, there was, no, there was no footage <laughs> then, really. Of, I mean, I remember months, my I, I wanted to watch myself bowl in a Sunday league game, and my dad recorded the, the uh, you know, the programme to BBC Two, and he recorded the wrong channel. So, you know, I, I didn't even manage to look at myself bowl. Uh, you know, so it just it just wasn't possible then to, to see yourself. So I had no idea what I was doing, but my God, it was good having you at second slip. I mean, Butch at second slip was like having about four fielders. So it was great. I must just say, I just say, you know, my favourite story about you was the day when um, Mike Brearley was batting and uh, someone got out. I think the op the other opener might have been Nobby or someone got out and you went in and somehow managed to run him out. And then soon yeah, ran, after... Ran, 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 ran out Clive Radley. No, then you ran out. I think you ran out Brears first or Brears got run out anyway and he yeah. came in. And he was like fuming because he got he got run out. And then you then you ran out Clive Radley. So Rad's kind of coming up the stairs soon afterwards. And Briers was so and cross. Then, and then I ran he, myself out. He ran, he and, then, ran. and then you ran yourself out. But before <laughs> you ran yourself out, Briers was so furious. He was still in his pads and his helmet. And he was England captain at the time. And he was so furious, he went onto the balcony at Lord's, on that little balcony, and right across the field shouted you and it was a c-u-n word you know beginning with c butch he shouted at the top of his voice the england captain screaming across the field at you and the, the mcc members have looked up in a total astonishment at, at the, this Eng england captain purple in the face issuing expletives to his team anyway that was the uh, that was a, a an isolated moment when you cocked it up well so, well, so many, as i said the, the finishing of that story was that after that happened, I, I then tried to run a two to Paddy Cliff at, at, at um, he was on the extra cover boundary and got run up myself and, and, and I came in and, um, and Briz went absolutely berserk. Yeah. And, um, yeah. You know, and then we, 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 we had a, a, a laugh about it. And then, you know, two minutes later, it, it, it was all fine. But mm. it, it was quite funny, as I said, those, those incidences of. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, running myself out as well. It was. Yeah, it was, God. Um, yeah, you're really jump in there. Yeah, um, Will, yeah, go Roland, for it. Roland, how are you doing for time? Because we've still got a couple of people want to ask questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, He's I'm all right. right. He's, He's all right. right. Okay, cool. question, Will. Right. I'm just going to bring Robin in. Okay. The next question. He can unmute himself. Ta da Good having you here, Will. No, that's all right. No problem. But you used to always help the cause. I like this all hands on deck sort of club. You know? <laughs> um, right. If Robin cannot unmute himself, then uh, Andy, let's go to you uh, for your for your next question for, for your your question, and then we'll go to you, Martin. Okay. Thanks, Will. Uh, hi, Roland. Hey, hey, Andy. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks. Um, did you have something to? Uh, some uh, involvement in the development of uh, Joffre Archer, is that right? Well, I say development, um, Joffre obviously was one of our young players and would have come through um, the BCA. You know, he played in our regional Barbados on the 19 team. So as chairman of the Centre of Excellence, the under 19s commander, um, myself, um, as I said, the under 13s, 15s, 17s, 19s, females under 23 comes under. Um, the Centre of Excellence, so Joffre would have gone through that. Yeah. Um, where I would have had a bit of involvement with Joffre was that, um, having identified his talent, um, I contacted 
uh, Mark Aleen, who was MCC coach at the time, and had arranged with Mark for Joffa to go to MCC Young Professionals. Um, Mark organized it. Um, some certain things happened, and in the end, he didn't go. But um, his talent was obvious um, from that stage. Yeah, I suppose um, the, the reason for asking, because I think uh, Joffre's, you know, he, he, the, the spotlight, I think he's really under it, given that he's, he's the, the, the one black player in the England team. Um, and, I, and I feel, I think a lot of people feel that he almost has to, he almost has to do, do better because of the criticism that he might come under. People, people analyse all sorts of things and, 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 and make all sorts of judgments. Um, and I, I just wondered really whether you felt when you made your debut, whether you had to do even better than, um, than a white person coming into the team because of that added pressure? I think when I played, you know, I, I felt that if I, you know, wanted to remain in the side, that's my personal view that I would have to do better um, yeah. Than my than my counterpart, I, I there was no point in me doing exactly the same as my counterpart because, you know, it could be a judgment call. Um, I always felt that I wanted to do better, um, so that there's no judgment call. I think Jofa's situation is is different because Jofa is looked at as really the number one guy. So his he 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 is really made a rod for his back by performing so well. The expectation from him now is, you know, nothing short of the standards that he has set. So anything below that, you know, people are going to start to, to, to critique. Um, you know, the fact also that, yes, you know, he's a black guy in the, in the England side. The fact that he set the bar so high, um, the expectation levels for him is far greater than perhaps for myself when I played. Because uh, when I played, um, you know, obviously... It was an unknown quantity, um, but he came in, hit the ground running from the start. He really, you know, in his first year, he achieved everything in his first year as an international cricketer. So, you know, he, he's got a lot to live up to. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that the players like Devon Malcolm were scrutinised? Because I, I, I felt that the sort of treatment that Devon got when he had a bad day was perhaps a little bit worse than in terms of media criticism um, than, than certain other players. I think Devon, Devon was not really managed properly. Um, Devon was unfortunate that throughout his career that he had um, some England managers that, you know, really perhaps one didn't understand Devon, didn't understand where he was coming from. Um, and really was a pretty poor, he was a poor communicator. Um, we know who we're talking about. And so the treatment Devon got um, really, you know, stifled him. Devon could have been a lot better player for England. If, if he had somebody like Mike Brady around, I can guarantee you, Devon would have had the same impact that Joffa Archer um, would have had in an England side because he would have been given the confidence um, to be that player. Not to be, um, you, know, he was, you know, he was always pushed in the background, questioned whether he was good enough, um, dropped from the side. Um, he wasn't managed properly. A, a, a better manager, would have got a lot more out of Devon Mountain. Mm. Great, thanks. Good question. Was Mike really the key to, to the, the success of Middlesex's diversity then, do you think, Butch? Um, Simon, he, he, obviously he, he was the one that had to put it together. But, you know, I put a lot of credit, I give Don Bennett a lot of credit because, okay. as I said, Bennett was not the traditional first team coach. So he was the one that really put the, the mixture together. And, you know, we had to come from, ben, from Bennett in the second eleven. We had to come from him to the really in the first team. So the product that Bennett sent from the second team, right, was a good product. So you've got to give Don Bennett a lot of credit. Uh, what Mike really did was that he, he, he was fortunate to have all of this young talent coming into the team at the same time as the older boys were being phased out. Not, well, I say phased out, they'd come to the end of their time. So the Murrays, the Parfits, the Titmus, the Price, you know, when I got into the side, those guys were at the end of their careers virtually. And then there was just a whole new group of young guys coming through. 
Gatting, Embry, Edmonds, myself, you, Selvi. So then really had to just mold that group together. But but I think Bennett played a big, big part in, it, in getting yeah. that together. Cool. Um, well, Yosa, we are having slight technical problems with Robin. Um, okay. So what I think what I'm going to tell do... him to ask his question on the on the yes, chat box. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to do, um, Roland, we've got we've got we've got one more we've got one more question. Whilst Robin types his question, I'm going to bring Martin in to yeah, sure. ask his question, and then uh, Robin can type his question on the chat box. So here's Martin. Oh, hi there, Roland. Uh, so really hi, good, uh, really good to uh, listen to you tonight. Uh, my question is, um, regarding your test debut, I mean, obviously, uh, on, the, on the island you were born, um, how, how were you um, received by the, crowd, the home crowd? And do you think that the West Indies bowlers bowl to you any different than they did to the rest of the England team? Or were you just another opposition player to them? Well, I think first and foremost, yeah, my, my debut here was in Barbados. And I guess I was very fortunate to to play a game, Barbados, because you must remember that the second test match was in Guyana. Um, I didn't play in the first test match in Trinidad, but I was in line to play in the second test in Guyana. And the test match was cancelled because of the mm -hmm. Robin Jackman affair, which meant that we moved on to the third test. So then that's how I got my opportunity to play here in Barbados. In terms of being received, I mean, um, you know, I was very well received, not just in Barbados, but Everywhere that I went, you know, people thought, obviously, it was an achievement. And, you know, they were very pleased for me. Obviously, they wanted West Indies to win. They wanted me to do well, but they wanted West Indies to win. In terms of the West Indian players, um, I would imagine that they would try a lot harder against me than, <laughs> than against the others, because yeah. they certainly wouldn't want me to be uh, successful against them. So, you know, they would, would try. And I wouldn't expect them to do anything less than that, because... Mm. You know, you know, they were a fantastic team. Um, you know, the, the England team, our team wasn't a bad team. I mean, I would say our England team was perhaps one of the best teams that England's ever had. Because when you've got Gooch and Boycott at the top, and then you've got Gower, you've got Gatting, you've got Botham, you've got Lily, you know, <clears throat> Willis, Embry, Downton, you know, you go down the line. Um, you know, you, you had some serious players as well. So... Yeah, they would have. I think they would have upped the, the ante against me for sure. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Thanks, Martin. All right. Um, I haven't seen Robin. Robin's uh, question. Okay. Um, right. so just give him a cut. Just try and yeah. get him to unmute once more. Then maybe. We'll we'll Robin, do. try and unmute if you mute. can. Can yeah. And then if not. If not, then... ah, here we go. Right, um, Roland, this this is this is Robin's question. So, um, so it's kind of similar to Annie's. Um, we've got a fab pedigree of uh, West Indies players um, at the Aegeus. So, I think it's kind of related to to um, Annie's Annie's question a bit. Um, Robin, if you could just expand a little bit more on the on the question, that'd be that'd be good. What does he say? Um, Great well, you to from coming to the Aegeus. Well, coming to the Aegeus on tour. We, yeah. we have a fab pedigree of brilliant West Indies players at the Aegeus. Mm. Um, well, the, um, the, question, the, the answer to that would be, yes, we'd be hoping to come to the Aegeus. Obviously, we would be in contact with um, um, Hampshire County Cricket Club, um, you know, to see what they can do. So the, the intention is that, yes, if we get an opportunity, we'll come there. And he's right. You know, they've got a, a history of fine West Indian cricketers at Hampshire. You know, you had Greenwich, you had Roberts, you had Marshall. Um, you had, you know, before that, you had Danny Livingston, Cardigan Connor. Um, you know, the list goes on. So, you know, Hampshire have had a good repre representation of, of top class. Um, Roy West Marshall. Players. Roy Marshall as well. Roy Marshall as well, yeah. yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, Desi, uh, Desi, um, Desi loved playing against Marshall, didn't he? That was a brilliant... <laughs> That used to be a, a fantastic little. In fact, I think I think Desi wished he'd play, probably play for Hampshire as well. He loved it down there, didn't he? Anyway, yes, um, so so good. Well, hopefully you can do that. I mean, it's a brilliant initiative, but you're doing that, and uh, we want to give you all the help you can uh, that you can get because we need it. Actually, we need you to do that. It's a, it's a really good idea. Um, Will, have you got a question just to finish or not? Um, 
I I do actually. Um, I had to very quickly think of one. Um, Ronald, what's the best piece of advice you were given as a young cricketer? Best piece of advice? Oh boy, that's a very very good question. Um, hmm. Oh, the best piece. Ooh, you're, 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 you're testing me there. You're I'm testing you now. <laughs> well, what would you? What advice would you give to a young cricketer now? Yeah, yeah there you go. Listen, my 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 advice to any cricketer now really would be, you know, first of all, you've got to dream big. Um, you know, you 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 have to dream it before you actually it becomes a reality. So, dream what you want to achieve, and then really work towards that. Um, don't be concerned about how or when the opportunity will come because you, you, will, you never know when it's going to happen. Um, I, I would use myself as an example. Um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a test cricketer at the time uh, because I only knew West Indies cricket. Um, obviously, I would have wanted to be a West Indies cricketer, but who was to know that in time I would become an England cricketer? 4,000 miles away. So I, would, so I would say, dream big. Don't worry about anything else. Dream big, work hard. And um, the opportunity will open up for you. Great. Great. That's nice. Or as, as Viv Richards likes to say, with the will comes along the skill <laughs> as well. Yeah, well, that's, like a good, that. that's a good saying. Anyway, and, that, and that, uh, that's a good little fitting end uh, with you on camera, Will. With the will comes the skill. Um, <laughs> right. Anyway, so thanks for your help, uh, Will, tonight. Uh, right. We've got one final thing for you to do, Butch, yes. after all those excellent questions, is you have to take part in our quiz. And I'll, the keep quiz score, Simon. I'll keep the score, Simon. I'll keep score. Sorry? I'll keep score. Okay, good. Uh, so the quiz is called How Well Do I Know Myself? Or How Well Do You Know Yourself? Uh, it starts with a bit of music. Just to get you in the spirit. How well do you think you know yourself, Butch? I would think I know myself pretty well. Um, if I don't know myself well, I wouldn't expect anyone else to. Okay, well, let's just test that out. So we've got 10 questions. No conferring or phoning a friend or anything like that, right? <laughs> if you get the answer right, you get this. He's got it! But if you get it wrong, you get a... <clears throat> okay. Let's go on. Right, and um, the leader on the, the leaderboard at the moment is Paul Farbrace with nine. Owen Morgan got eight. We've right. had a lot of these. We've had a lot of different rounds. The current I round is the worst. round about five. And actually, I can't show you the leaderboard because my uh, thing isn't working, but it's Paul Farbrace in first place with nine points. Owen second and eight, and level with Nick Compton on eight. So there's quite a sort of Middlesex feel to this, actually. In fact, it's totally Middlesex at right. the moment. Um, right, so question one. On what ground did you make your first class debut, your county first class debut? Uh, Middlesbrough. He's got it! Correct. And do you know what you scored, just as a, a, a little aside? I thought that was going to be another point. Zero. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I'm not giving you an extra point for that, uh, but you did. You, get, you got a duck on your uh, first class debut against Yorkshire at Ackland Park, Middlesbrough. Yeah. Right. Good. Well done. Question two. How many did you make on your test match debut? Test match debut? I think I made 17. He's got it! Excellent answer. Obviously at the Bridgetown Oval against the West Indies, 1981. And the next question, question three, is connected to that match. Name the four-pronged pace attack you faced that day. Holding, Roberts, Garner, Croft. He's got it! We had a three. And, I mean, what a horrible idea. <laughs> that, that is actually, you know, if you had to pick the, the, the combination that is the worst, I almost think that's it. Of all those great fast bowlers... And Garner, Simon, Holden, Simon, Robertson, you know who was, you know who was on the bench? Malcolm Marshall. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Amazing. And Sylvester Clark was in the wings as well. So no, but Marshall I mean, was in the twelve. Was in the twelve. Marshall was in the twelve. God, amazing, isn't it? Well, it was a young. He was only very young then, wasn't he? So, yeah. 
you know, but I, I think that, you know, I think Garner holding Roberts Croft is almost the worst combination you could get. So <laughs> that was a baptism fire. Anyway, well done. Three out of three. OK, what's your highest first class score? Question four. 197. That was a half volley on, on your pads. 197, correct, against Yorkshire? Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah, OK, cool. Excellent. Well, this is keep the scores uh, fairly easy to keep at the moment, Will, isn't it? Um, yeah, so easy. Yeah, okay. yeah. Very Question good. five. You scored England's quickest half century on your ODI debut. How many balls did you face? 35. He's got it! I'll give you that, actually. It was actually 36. He's got it! But I'll give you it. Okay, 36. Uh, it was the actual correct answer, but that's fair enough. Okay, 35 balls. Uh, I'll be generous. Okay. Five out of five? Yes? Yeah, five out of five, yeah. Question six. You played over 500 first class and one day matches in total. How many catches in your career was it? 280, 330 or 370? That's adding together your first class catches and your ODI, or your uh, list A catches. So was it 370, 330, or 280? I was uh, 280. Mm. Well, it's You're well off. It was well, actually... 280, 280 would have been a first class, wouldn't it? Yeah, 280 was first class. 374, actually. So 370 would have been... The correct yeah. answer there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. With the first one you got wrong. Five out of six. Question seven. On which southern county ground did you average over 50? What was your best county ground um, where you averaged over 50, basically? And you played a lot of games at, at as well. Mm. Southern, a southern county ground. Southern county ground. It wouldn't be Kent, would it? No. I'll give you one more. I'll give you one more guess. Seven, seven. Including outgrounds? No. Well, yeah, but it's not an outground, actually. No. You don't know, do you? So you can't, I, I can't give you this unless you... I'll give him Go it. on, have a, have a quick guess. Come have on. Have a quick guess. Um... Sure, sure. Oh, so the, the, the oval. The oval. Mm. No, your oh. average at the oval was pitiful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, it was actually hove. Oh, yeah, oh, I, I just had this of image course. of you hooking of Lester Pygott charging down the hill. I yeah, had this yeah, yeah, image yeah. of you constantly hooking him into the, into the bleachers. You yeah. averaged 50 at home anyway in 12, 12 matches. So very good. Uh, but unfortunately, you got that wrong. So that five is seven. five out of five seven. seven. Okay, three to go. Yeah. Question eight. How many butchers have played international cricket? I would say three. Myself, Mark. Yes. Alan. Yeah. Who's the fourth? Basil. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, I'm if he was still, I, I don't think he's still alive, is he? But no, no, no. He's... No. Well, he'd be he'd be biting your head off if if if, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. if he was still alive. <laughs> I'm afraid you. Well, you forgot Basil Butcher, right? Um, who obviously played for for, for the West Indies. Uh, yeah. No, I did not say England. No, no true, I said true. international cricket. You didn't listen. Yeah. What's the score, Will? Five out of eight. Totally. Right, you've got to get these last two then. Yeah. Okay, question nine. How many Man of the Match awards did you win? I would say a three. I'll give you that, actually. He's got it! It, it was actually four. 
but anyway, you you did yourself down there, so yeah. I'll give you that one. Okay, four man of the match, and do you know three of them? You scored sixty five, bizarrely. <laughs> I looked it up. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> three three man well, of the match awards. You all you, you made sixty five in each inning. So there's well, something. Well, I I remember I remember getting it in the quarterfinals and semifinals of of, of the net West. Yeah. yeah. So right, final question. That's six out of eight, isn't it? So final six question. Out of eight, yeah. Last now one. this is a slightly left field question. I apologise for this. Yeah. Um, this is a very sort of personal question, really. What was your most irritating habit as a hotel roommate? <laughs> Have a little I, think. I, Have I, a little I, think I, about. I, I, I presume the the the, um, the irritation was for someone like yourself. Um, I guess there, 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 would, there would be there would be two. Um, there would be eating in the room and snoring. <laughs> <laughs> I give you both of those. Uh, correct. Um, it was a combination of, I mean, you could have had any of these actually, eating in the room and leaving the remains of your chicken Kiev on the floor for me to tread in at one o'clock in the morning in the dark. <laughs> yes, yeah, snoring all night and then getting up at six o'clock in the morning when I've only gone to bed at one and making a, an absolute racket in the bathroom, clearing your nostrils and flooding the bathroom with a lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> so that then when well, I came in in my socks, my socks were soaking wet. Um, yeah, anyway. And, 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 Simon, um, and you didn't get the message that you had to be in earlier at night. No, I know. Well, it was all my fault, obviously. <laughs> you know, in one, on one occasion, I, it was rooming with you that I, um, I actually crept in late at night to clean my teeth. And di I, lit, I, I dipped into my um, toilet bag to get out the toothpaste to clean my teeth and accidentally Instead of the tube of toothpaste, I got out a tube of Ralgex and cleaned my teeth with that. <laughs> and uh, my God, I was drinking a lot of water that night. I'll tell you, after <clears throat> cleaning my teeth with Ralgex, I had good breath anyway. Um, <laughs> so, Roland Butcher finishes with seven out of ten, which is okay. Yeah, not quite as good as your fielding, which I will give nine and a half. <laughs> but yeah so you know a, a, a middle of the road performance i'm afraid but maybe the questions were a little bit tricky but thank you anyway for your um, participation tonight um final thought test match england series what's the what's the, what, what, can can west indies win that series do you think i mean can you do you think england can recover their um ignominy from australia and compete in the test series well, Simon, it, it really depends on the team that England send um, for that series. Um, as you know, you know, I don't think England won a series in the Caribbean since 2004. So, you know, it's a long time since they won a series. So there's a bit of pressure on England as well. I think West Indies would also know of that history as well, um, which should give them some confidence. It, it should be a, a very, very good series. Um, obviously, England have got some... They've got to answer some problems that they had in Australia, albeit this would be a, a different type of challenge to what they faced in Australia, but they've still got to come back from that disappointment. So, you know, to say who's going to win this one, it, I think it's going to be very, very close. If there's three tests, I can see 2-1 to someone. But you're not going to say who. And um, what, what, will there be a, a big buzz? I mean, obviously, there'll be England fans, which would be good. What about the locals? Are they going to be you know, really into it? Or do you think they're more interested in the short format now? No, no, they, they'll be into it as well. I mean, I, listen, I, I'm hoping that come March that, you know, you're back to full stadiums. Um, this five-match series um, was down to 50%. Um, I was at every game, and I can tell you there was more than 50% in there. <laughs> it was at least 75%. So I think they need to go the full hog in make it 100% vaccinated people and, and get people into the stadiums. Um, it's eagerly awaited um, by the West Indian fans. They will remember the last time they were here, what happened in that series. So everybody will be looking forward to it. Okay, great. Listen, thank you very much anyway. Um, you can go and have your, um, your evening stroll now before the sun sets. Um, 
uh, lovely life you live there's in. So many. Awesome. In, 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 in Barbia, this, most people do that. And I did that at um, 5.30 this morning when morning. I took my grandson to the, to okay. the gym. So it, not in the afternoon. Okay. No, it gets a bit hot in the afternoon, I suppose. Okay, fine. Well, you know, enjoy your evening anyway. And we look forward to seeing you in the summer when you're over. And we, we really would, you know, really look forward to that that tour you're doing because it sounds great work. So um, good luck with it. And thanks again from everybody for, for your time and, uh, and your spirit tonight uh, for all this afternoon view. It was great. Yeah, good so I mean, thanks for having me and um, thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, it was a great pleasure. Cool. Well done. And feel free to, to depart. Thanks for your time. Cheers, Cheers. again. See you later.